But then we're also finding out, as we've been able to um, kind of uncode the DNA, the 3.2 billion base pairs that makes up our individual, very unique blueprint for life, um, how a lot of those genes, those nucleotides there, um, basically are involved in coding for some of our very complex behaviours. So, for example, our impulsivity, mm -hmm. our compulsivity, our predisposition to addictive behaviours, even things like possibly, you know, the way that we socially interact, how we have our, how we form our friendship groups, how extroverted or introverted we might be, whether we might be predisposed to towards, you know, depression, for example, or even um, autism or schizophrenia. Some people that might be, for example, biologically predisposed towards depression. And so for them, it's not helpful for, for people to say, oh, just think your way out of it. The higher the number of females within the group, the more successful that group would be. And that's not because females were inherently more intelligent. All right, when we're live here in Cambridge. Jonathan, hello. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Critchlow. It's a, it's a pleasure and thank you for, for cycling all this way to chat with me. Um, I hear you have a new book. I do. Yes, I do. It was published just a couple of weeks ago now. It's called Joined Up Thinking, published with Hodder. And I have to say, it is a belter of a book in a good way. You know, it's a really good book. I'm Canadian. What, do, what does belter mean? I, do, I said it and I, I'm actually not entirely sure. <laughs> it's some, I think I've heard other people say it before. I think it means it's really good. But why would a belt be really good? I mean, I, <laughs> it's a really good belt. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I trust that it's uh, it's very good. Oh no, maybe it's more like a belter. Like you know, when somebody is very loud and there's a really good song that's like an anthem that people sing along with. I see. Yeah, it's that kind of belter of a book. Okay, well, I hope this uh, this chat is a is a belter of a chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So. I first I first came across um, what you do. So you're you're a neuroscientist by profession, mm -hmm. and um, I came across a couple of talks that you you've gave you've given, and which led me to your previous book, the the science of fates, where you sort of uh, you you demystify so maybe some some popular ideas in, in neuroscience, and um, you propose that maybe we are are more subject to our biology than we'd we'd, we'd hope to think. Um, and it was a great read, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated by people like you because you know you're you're in the lab doing doing hard science, and then you translate all of that into into ways that the public can access. So, what what got you interested in sort of studying um, the science of of our fate and our our biological destiny, if you will? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a bit of a kind of. Um it's not really a straight line in terms of my career, I think. So originally I was interested in pursuing medicine um, and then I worked uh, in my gap year. So my year between um, kind of school and going to university, I decided to work as a nursing assistant in a local psychiatric hospital. So I was working mainly on the adolescent wards uh, and I was working with children who had a wide variety of different diagnoses from or, you know, very severe autism to bipolar personality disorder or schizophrenia. Um, and, you know, their behaviours, this was going back 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. their behaviours were very challenging. Um, and they had been brought to this particular hospital. Um, they were all sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Um, they were, you know, very young te um, teenagers. Um, lovely, really lovely kids. And... You know, it really changed my perspective on behavior uh, and, and, it, and just on life, I think, generally. But it also made me realize that I wasn't, A, emotionally robust enough to work on the wards because I found it, it was very upsetting. Sure. Um, and this was at a time 20 years ago when there was a lot of stigma about mental health issues and also quite a lot of the treatments that were available. Um, they just weren't working. So what types of patients were you seeing at that time or did you observe? Um, so there were... Generally, I was working with children mm -hmm. um, and they had wide ranging different diagnosis. Um, so autism, personality disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia. Um, yeah, there was a wide variety of different behaviors. Some of the children had had some very horrific traumatic events that had occurred earlier in their lives, but some of them hadn't. And then also, when you looked at the staff that were working on the wards, Quite a lot of them had had, um, you know, 
quite challenging upbringings as well. And that's what motivated them to work within the oh, hospital setting. That makes sense. Yeah, and it, and it really made me think, you know, why is it that there's these children that are, you know, effectively they're being locked up in these psychiatric hospitals um, because that is deemed not safe for themselves and for others, for them to go out um, as things stood at the time. Right. Um, so why is it that the staff were able to go home after their 12-hour shift, you know, and they may have not had great upbringings or great occurrences in life. Whereas there was something about these children that meant that they weren't able to, and they weren't thriving, they weren't flourishing. Um, and I really got interested in the biology behind that. Um, and so I changed direction for my studies and went off and did cell and molecular biology uh, and then did a PhD looking at brain connectivity. So oh, I was looking okay. at connections in the brain, um, trying to understand more about how psychosis and delusions actually arise and how our perception of the world forms and how different memories from our life experience can then go on to affect how we perceive the world and how we form our sense of reality and then instruct how we interact with it. So right. yeah, became absolutely fascinated with that kind of subject area and just generally neuropsychiatry, so how our behaviours arise. And at the same time, so this was again, I'm saying like, you know, 20 years ago, um, in my undergraduate degree, I was, there was a large component of it was looking at um, human molecular genetics. So looking at, you know, the genome had been recently sequenced uh, and we were getting huge amounts of data on our genetic code. So the DNA that we're given from our mum and our dad, mm -hmm. kind of untangling the sequences of that and seeing how it can predispose us to lots of different types of behaviour. So we all know, for example, you know, it's really widely accepted that our eye colour or even our hair colour, right. or even our height, even our weight maybe. You know, quite a lot of that is coded by the genes that we're given from our mum and from our dad. But then we're also finding out, as we've been able to um, kind of uncode the DNA, the 3.2 billion base pairs that makes up our individual very unique blueprint for life, um, how a lot of those genes, those nucleotides there, um, basically are involved in coding for some of our very complex behaviours. So, for example, our impulsivity, mm -hmm. our compulsivity, our predisposition to addictive behaviours, even things like possibly, you know, the way that we socially interact, how we, have our, how we form our friendship groups, how extroverted or introverted we might be, whether we might be predisposed to, towards, you know, depression, for example, or even um, autism or schizophrenia, which, you know, generally speaking, that that type of diagnosis might not come in the case of schizophrenia until late teens or even older, you know, in the 20s or even in some cases in your 40s in life. So how can these genes give um, a biological kind of predisposition to very complex behaviours that go on to affect our life trajectory and the way that we lead our life. So our destiny, if you like. So right. I became really interested in that. And um, that's basically the book. I, I think faith. that's, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's fascinating as an idea um, for, for two reasons. One, I think um, we live in an interesting age in, in terms of popular science, where I think neuroscience and psychology is getting a lot of attention. Um, people want to know about themselves, right? And I think um, a, a lot of, we're, we're being sold this idea of like the, the power of neuroplasticity and the power to sort of shape um, our behaviors. And from reading your book and actually speaking with a few other people on this podcast who, who do behavioral genetics and, and things like that, um, I, I was quite surprised to, to realize that maybe we're more subject to our biology than we would like to, to think. Exactly. And, I, you know, my, my PhD here at Cambridge University was actually looking at synaptic plasticity, this mm -hmm. idea that our brain can change in response to our environments. Um, and I think, you know, and, and obviously I very much believe in that. I could literally see it occurring down the microscope, um, you, know, you know, new connections forming as we learn and remember new things from our environment. So the shape of our brain literally changes in response to the things that we're exposed to in our life. And, and it's wonderful to see that and to accept that. But I think also we've been almost oversold it. Right. There's been a lot of hype about it, as you kind of said. Um, and, and I think it can be possibly more empowering to actually accept that there is some degree of biological constraint within that scope for plasticity. 
And so, you, you know, there's some people that might be, for example, biologically predisposed towards depression. And so for them, it's not helpful for, for people to say, oh, just think your way out of it. You know, there's, there's plasticity. If you just change the way that you're behaving, then you can change your brain. And so therefore you, you don't have to be uh, kind of depressed. You know, sometimes it, that's not the case. And right. it can be very helpful to accept that. Yeah, you, you toy around this idea of, of free will. And I feel like there's this tension in your book where you like, do we have free will? Yes or no. And then you kind of invoke philosophy and science and you, you, you cite a lot of, a lot of other, other thinkers. And um, I, I want to I chat with you about like the extent of maybe, maybe our, our free will there. Because um, so how, how, how deep does this uh, biological influence go? Because like you, like you mentioned, I can, I can understand that, you know, my eye color and my hair color is, is um, inherited. That's mm -hmm. fine. I can accept that. I look at my mom and dad. I resemble them. That makes sense. Um, and then you kind of branch out a little bit more and you, you talk about things like, like personality. Am I, am I more extroverted or introverted? Well, okay. I can, I can maybe, do, uh, I can, I can accept that those things might be slightly heritable, but then you say things like how we select our friends. And I think, well, no, certainly I, I screen my friends based on, you know, what I think is good moral character. And then you get even further outside of that bubble, like existential questions almost, um, what are my thoughts? What are my attitudes towards romance? Um, do I believe in in a higher deity? And are are those types of questions also? Is there is there any sort of biological foundation for those those types of things? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the genomics revolution is really showing that um, when we look at things like eye color and um, height, for example. So the genetic heritability, which is the proportion of differences that we see that might be due to the genetic variation within that person. Um, so that heritability value um, for eye colour or for height, for example, could be something in the region of, say, 80-90%. When we look at things like, for example, intelligence as measured by IQ scores, the heritability is estimated to be around 55%. So that's still quite a sizable amount, you know. There's still scope for change within that because 45% is thought to be due to our environmental factors, maybe our diet or um, the people that surround us or our schooling, for example. Mm -hmm. But when we think, look at things like our ideology or even our belief system, our religiosity, then again, we're seeing um, heritability values um, of around in the region of 40%. So still, that's quite that's quite a sizable amount. And when we look at for things like you were talking about um, uh, the way that we make friends and who we make friends with. So there's right. this wonderful person called Robin Dunbar. He works at Oxford University. He's a professor of anthropology there. And he's come up with this um, idea. He's been working for many, many, many decades and he's got a huge amount of data behind him. Um, he's come up with this wonderful idea that we have what the equivalent of a supermarket barcode on our forehead. And when we go and meet people... What we're doing without any conscious awareness is that we're really scanning individuals <laughs> to find out whether we have commonalities between them. So we're all inherently drawn towards novelty to some degree, but also we're drawn towards making sure that we don't have to expend too much energy in our brains because our brains are really... Um, they consume a huge amount of energy. They consume something like 20% of our daily energy quota. So they're taking up a huge amount of energy in order for us to conjure up our sense of reality uh, and instruct how we're going to interact. So we don't want to waste too much energy right. interacting with people if we can't quite understand where they're coming from. And so actually it makes more sense for us to become friends with people that might have similar backgrounds to us, similar ways of looking at the world and see similar ways of communicating. Because otherwise, we find it difficult to understand where they're coming from and our brains just have to do too many computations in order to make sense of them. So his idea is that we have this kind of bar scan and uh, this kind of scanning code on our foreheads and we go around trying to figure out who we should be expending our social energy on in interacting in order to make the most of that interaction. And there's some people that are, perhaps you'd call them extroverts, mm -hmm. and they are willing to go around and expend more energy on social interactions, but a wider range of social interactions. And they've got a different region within their brain that's slightly larger. And Dunbar's idea is that they've actually got more beta endorphin receptors and they're wired to go out, they're predisposed to go out and be motivated to interact with more people, more different people, 
in order to fill up those beta endorphin slots and feel satisfied. Whereas introverts, we could call them, spend a, a smaller, have, they have a smaller network of friends, so they know fewer people and have less motivation to go out and interact with as many people, but they expend more energy on each one of those individuals. So they create, if you like, a community of um, support of close mm-hmm. support networks. Whereas the extroverts are there going around making sure that ideas and innovation can hop from small group to small group so that it doesn't become a stagnant echo chamber. Right. Now, both types of people are very important within a society to make sure that it's smooth running so that you've got the support and established relationships and network of help there, but also so that you've got innovation uh, and ideas crossing between group and group. So both types of people, very important to society. And there's a biological predisposition towards which type of person you probably are. And you can look in the brain and start to predict with some degree of sensitivity right, right. as to what type of person, how you go about having your interactions with people. So that's so that's one aspect right. of how our biology can actually give rise to our behavior. But within the book, I also look at, for example, um, how our kind of ideology and our religious beliefs are set up um, or and how, for example, our food patterns, our eating patterns are set up and our food preferences. Right, right. Even our love interest, our romantic <laughs> relationships. Again, you can see some quite compelling data on how our genes are predisposed to make us um, find people attractive if they have a very different immune system repertoire to us. And the thinking of this is so... so Without you you realizing this, or I myself realizing this, I might be sniffing you out to find out whether I might find you attractive. Right. And if I did find you attractive, it might be because you've got a very different immune system to me. And therefore, if we had a child together, then um, that child would have a really strong, diverse immune system. So it would be able to ward off more bugs. So that's happening unconsciously. All of these decisions are happening unconsciously without our brain being consciously aware of it. I, I, you, you touched upon a, a lot of interesting things there. I think um, you, you're mentioning the a, a extrovert introvert um, sort of duality there. And I, I think the, those are both adaptive strategies, just sort of in different ways. And I, I think that lines up a lot with um, the sort of the subject matter of your, your new book, Joined Up Thinking. So um, we'll, we'll park that here for a second. Mm-hmm. I want to come back to that. Um, but you, you were talking about this idea of, of love interests and, and how we select mates. And a lot of this processing, we like to believe is conscious, right? Because we put so much emphasis on um, our intimate partner and they say something about us, right? Who's, who we select says something about us. And of course we want someone who's compatible and romantic and, and does all of those things. But there's a lot of these um, unconscious drives that we, we're, we're not even um, so aware of um, that are really at play here. So, so are we truly um, f- free in, in those decisions of choosing our friends and choosing a romantic partner. Well, I, I guess it's maybe it's somewhere somewhere in the middle. There's these there's these constraints, as you're saying, um, but we, we do have sort of leeway to sort of play within the joints, if you will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, really key to all of this, underpinning all of this, is the fact that our perception of the world is also, you know, slightly flawed. So there's some lovely work that's come out of Chris Frith and Yuta Frith's lab at University College London. So they've looked at how if you get different type, different people together and allow them to freely discuss what they're seeing the problem is within. So they're given a particular environment and they've got to kind of say what's going on within that environment and where a problem might be. And when they get people to be able to freely discuss their their version of reality with each other, they're more likely to get towards a more accurate representation of reality. And this goes to show that each of us has actually a slightly flawed version of reality. We're each wandering around in our very different perception of the world. We notice different things. We're conscious of different things. And that's based on our genes, but also our experiences. Um, and, and that goes on to obviously instruct how we're going to interact with the world. So we're each seeing the world in a very different way as well. Right. I, yeah, I, I think our perception of things, we're, we're often, we're sort of trapped in, in the bubble of our own perception because that, mm. that is our reality. Um, you, you quoted uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky in your book saying that um, his argument for, for biological determinism effectively that um, I can't imagine li- living as though free will didn't exist. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so maybe we can never truly perceive ourselves as um, entirely bio, like um, as at the expense of our biological drives um, because of the way we perceive perceive the world. And th that's really important. There's some some studies that have sh shown that actually when you make people not believe in their own agency so they have you make them think that they've got no control over their lives and actually they're more likely to veer towards making immoral decisions so because they they think oh well it's not my responsibility the behavior isn't right. under my own responsibility it's not my fault i'm behaving like this it's my genes it's my brain <laughs> and so therefore i've got to get out of jail card i can behave in any way possible so there is some danger to my having written this book, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, which, I, which I am aware of. So I, I, yeah. I, I was thinking similar things because they're like you're saying, it's like this get out of jail free card. Let's let's start from the, the obesity example and then maybe move into like the criminality stuff, because mm -hmm. I think those have varying degrees of impact on society, both, you know, important conversations to have. But um, let's take obesity, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't think it's it's new information that it's a sort of a looming popular, uh, a looming um concern for mm -hmm. especially Western societies. Um, morbid obesity, obesity is steadily rising. And I don't remember the exact figures you quoted, but um, it, is a, it is a problem that we, we have to, we have to <laughs> address. Um, but I, I think the, the public consensus of this problem is, is largely um, on, on individuals. You know, if I see someone who's, who's relatively out of shape, um, I might make a judgment on them cast judgment about um, their morality or their ability to control themselves or, or make decisions um, or just lack of self-control as a whole. And I, I look at them as sort of in, an, in a negative light. But given all of uh, this understanding that we're now sort of drawing from, from neuroscience and our understanding of the, the genome, there might be other factors at play there. Yeah, and I think, you know, as the data um, becomes unavoidable for policymakers, you know, they have to accept that obesity is a growing problem, if you excuse the pun. Uh, it's costing the NHS and most healthcare systems, you know, a huge amount, as is diabetes. Um, and there is, you know, a genetic predisposition towards these types of behaviours. So in which case, actually, what we need to do is make sure, because there is still an environmental um, kind of, um, there's an environmental push behind any type of decision making. And so therefore what we need to do is make sure that the environment supports those people that are predisposed to have these vulnerabilities. And that's the, you know, the main argument of the book. So simple things like, for example, in the UK, um, the supermarkets here now no longer have the ability to have um, sweeties and confectionery right at the aisle where you go and pay. So quite often you go shopping, you've got, you know, you've got your bits right. that you've got to go and get, you've made your list. Uh, and then at the end, perhaps you're like, phew, I've done all my shopping. And so therefore, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to cave in and I'm going to get this chocolate bar here. Right. I'm going to get these crisps. I'm going to get all of this stuff. Actually, just remove that temptation and make it easier for individuals so to is, make no healthy. Allowed. So that, that's, that no longer happens in UK supermarkets. Wow. Yeah. So, you know... The simple things like that. And for example, making the choice between a chocolate biscuit and a piece of fruit um, economically easier. So for example, if a banana or um, an apple was half the price of a chocolate bar, that would help people to make that decision towards going, making it the best decision. Of course, of course. And if, for example, supermarkets were encouraged when people were doing their online shopping to kind of advertise the healthier choices rather than the unhealthy choices, again, that would be, a, you know, a fantastic policy, I think. I think that that's, that surprises me a lot. I didn't know that that was the case here because I was at the, I've, I've been to a couple markets while I've been, been around um, in London and, uh, and Cambridge and I, at the sort of, uh, at the cash, there's, there's like nuts and like yogurts and healthy options. And I just thought, oh, this, maybe this is what they prefer here. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so it's quite a recent change. So that is really interesting. There's, um, uh, so under David Cameron's government, which was maybe, oh gosh, I should know, maybe about 10 years ago? Sure. Eight years ago? I, I'm yeah. going to trust you on that. Okay, well, no, don't. I don't know. I, I should know off the top of my head, but I don't. It feels like it was 10 years ago, but who knows? Like, it's been strange time warp over the last fair few enough, years. Fair enough, fair enough. It's not 10 years ago. It's probably about five years ago. Jeez, where is the time? Yeah, anyway, so... Um, under his leadership, he set up the behavioral insights uh, team that was basically using findings from neuroscience and psychology to help 
influence people's decision making? I think that's brilliant. I, I, th- I think that's a good example of science informing policy in, in a productive way for, for society because um, I think the extreme end of, uh, of sort of, um, what do you, like this biological determinism argument is that, um, are, are there just winners and losers effectively of like this genetic lot- lottery well, I don't think that's the case. No, I, no, 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 no. And if you look at the major, the huge majority of scientists and academics that are working in these types of fields, they're incredibly liberal because you can see that there are biological constraints within mm-hmm. each of us. We each have our, you know, vulnerabilities or flaws, if you like. And, and on the flip side, we each have our strengths, right? So what we want to do as a society is help support people so that they make good decisions so that they're flaws or idiosyncrasies aren't kind of manipulated or exposed by the environment in a bad way and so support make support them in their decision making there without them consciously possibly consciously being aware and then just try and make the most out of the strengths that each individual can offer and that is the point of a smooth running society right. is to make the most out of everybody that's there every member that's there i i think that's that's absolutely brilliant and that's sort of I think that's a good segue into your new book that you're yes that you're working on, um, joined up thinking. And yes. let me let me see if I understand the, the premise. We were talking off camera, and you mm-hmm. sort of yeah, you, know, you mentioned that there's there's all of us with these predispositions, and we know we all perceive the world differently. And you effectively argue that this is this is a very adaptive um, strategy, um, and it's good for society. Um, is that is that correct? That's what you've been you've been writing on and looking at, or am I, am I missing some elements there? Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So it was very much inspired by um, the science of fate. And I just want to can I really quickly go back to science of fate because this no. is a really cool kind of like technological development. Um, so we're now able to image. Uh, babies' brains in the womb as their brain is developing. And we can see that neural circuitry, so those eight to six billion nerve cells, kind of connecting up for that baby in the womb. And we can watch that from around second trimester of pregnancy. But we can also analyze the baby's brain when it's first born as well, so it's a newborn. And what you can see using these incredible new technologies is that the genes that you're given from your mum and dad line up with how those neural circuits, so a lot of these genes that are involved in really complex behaviors that we've just been talking about, ideas, Ideology, intelligence, um, eating preferences, how we form relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these genes are involved in paving how that brain circuit is going to wire up when we're a baby and then how it's going to operate throughout the life into old age, right? Mm. And you can start to see that there's these genetic genes that we've, genetic predispositions, genes that we've been given from our mum and dad that may have mutated as well or changed in, and recombined in different ways within each of us. Um, and that's linked to how that the architecture of the neural circuit in the baby that's just been born um, and how that then is linked to the behaviors, the very complex behaviors. Um, so we can start to piece together all of this information to see destiny and that watch how it starts to unfold. So all of these technologies are coming together. The genomics revolution, the imaging revolution within neuroscience so that we can see the brain and how we also look at how um, life trajectories are um, kind of occurring for individuals because we've also got this big data revolution so we can start to see how people's lives are panning out uh, to quite a fine level of resolution. Um, So... So I I wanted to use that data and to think about that data in a way that could be useful and positive for society, not in some horrible way to resurrect eugenics, for example. Right, right. You know, because we've got atrocious examples throughout our history of, um, you know, Nazi uh, kind of um, execution of millions of people. Even in Sweden, I think there was mass sterilization of um, disabled children until you know quite late in the last century um and similar things were going on within america as well right um there's been you know atrocious examples of eugenics movements and i don't want the the biological data and all of this information to be used to help spur on another eugenics movement actually what it should be used for is to think well what's the point what is the point in us all be having this complexity in the way that we behave and at this complexity in our DNA code that allows this wide breadth, this vast breadth of behaviors that as a species we are capable of. You know, because you have different strengths to me. Right. I have different weaknesses to you. 
What's the point of that? Well, it's the, the point of it is so that when we bring different individuals together that have different biologies, different experiences, then what, what we found, and there's lots of studies that have shown this, is that actually when you bring a group of diverse people together, so genetically diverse people, people with different ages, people with different cultural experiences and different early years experiences, and you get them to work together or bring their opinions together in a new way, what you start to see is actually their intelligence that's on offer is much greater than any individual part. So, for example, you can see this in action when we look at Wikipedia, you okay. know, the on, like this online um, kind of editing process has worked and it's resoundingly successful. Right. Or we can see it in the legal system, the judicial system, where we're using the power of the crowd, the jury, in order to make important decisions. I mean, there's some flaws sometimes with this, but we're trying to ba- um, cancel out individual bias or errors in our perception making when we bring people together. And you can see time and time and time again that when you do bring people together, then generally speaking, they get a more representative view of reality and they are able to problem solve and innovate more effectively. Which, so would this be um, sort of what makes democracy successful, if you will? It's like sort of all of us using our, our intelligence to the best of our abilities to sort of cast the best, the best solution for, for society, whether it be in the judicial system or in healthcare or in other things. Because you, you mentioned um, like a, an idea that I sort of extrapolate out of that is that the, the what do you want to like? the whole is greater than sort of any one individual, right? Mm-hmm. That you're, you're generating a higher intelligence is, and when you say that, do you mean like the collective intelligence of the group? Yes. Like what, what exactly do you mean by intelligence? Um, well, yeah, it depends on how you measure it. It very much depends on how you measure it. So there's some wonderful studies that have been conducted by Anita Woolley, uh, who's in America, but also with Thomas Malone um, at MIT. Mm-hmm. And they are looking at groups of people that are working together to try and solve a problem. So they're innovating and problem solving together. And what, so they're looking at that type of intelligence. And what they found is that there's a really robust predictor for how well a group will do in terms of solving a problem. So in order to solve a problem, you've got to see the problem accurately. You've got to come up with a creative way of working to solve that problem. Um, And you've got to innovate as well. Uh, And you've got to be able to communicate with each other in order to harvest all of that information, right? Is this like a perceptual issue? Like the more people you have, the more the better you can perceive reality? So part of it, so exactly, yeah. So when we're talking about group work, yeah, so part of it, a big part of it is a perceptual problem. And so what you see time and time again is that when you bring a group of people together, they are more likely to perceive the environment in a more accurate way. So they're seeing the real world. Because our brains... um, but our, our senses, um, each one of us is actually bringing in something in the region of 11 million bytes of data per second through our senses. Wow. And our brain is only consciously aware of aware of around 40 to 50 bytes a second. So that's a minuscule proportion, right? So mm-hmm. each one of us is focusing in on a very small amount of data from the outside world. But when you bring together a group of people, you can actually start to cancel out that bias or kind of shortcuts in information processing that each one individual person is making so that you're more likely to see the real picture, the real reflection of the situation. So is this a a matter of just number of inputs? Like the more people I have working on a particular problem, the better solution will come out on the other side? That can help, but actually, so going back to Anita's study, um, Anita Woolley's study with Thomas Malone, actually the biggest predicting factor for how a group could problem solve um, their way out of an an, an issue together was um, gender ratio. So the Oh, fascinating. Can you tease that apart for me? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually the higher the number of females within the group, the more successful that group would be. And that's not because females were inherently more intelligent So they also took the IQ scores of the individual members of the group, and that wasn't linked, actually, remarkably, to how well the group would do. So independent of IQ. This is independent of IQ. Yeah, yeah, it was actually the gender ratio was the biggest predicting factor for how well that group would do. And that was because females are much more likely to turn take. So they listen to other members of the group. They ensure that there isn't dominance dynamics. 
so that one person creates an echo like clone like kind mm. of um kind of echo chamber right um actually what happens is that the greater number of females within the group the more turn taking the more listening there was and so therefore they were able to get towards a more representative view of the problem and then harness that brain power that was on offer in terms of innovating and problem solving their way out of the issue is is that um is that finding just across groups or are there particular um let's say types of problems or maybe workplaces or activities where um that that um gender ratio difference is, is better seen like i'm not sure what the study what the the task was that they were so it was it was a number of different problem solving tasks oh a number of different yeah problem yeah it was a tasks. number of different problem solving and it was the m- most robust factor so oh, interesting yeah yeah so now it's not thought it's not that you know males are inherently not capable of listening and turn taking sure. although actually and i spoke to Anita Woolley and she says that it might be linked to testosterone levels she, right. there, there's some indication but actually it's thought it's probably more to do with, with a cultural um kind of expectation that boys from a young age in certain cultures aren't taught that actually listening and turn taking is a really important skill so in in a lot of cultures there's this idea that hierarchy competition being the loudest in the room being you know the most dominant in the room is the is the best well actually that's not going to be um helpful as we need to problem solve uh and and our way out of challenges like climate change for example or the number of issues that are pressing humanity at the moment fair so are, are these like um I, I just want to understand this correctly because I, I do think there there might be there there's definitely merit to like hierarchical organizations like any any company sort of operates in a, in a hierarchical fashion right so when you're talking about these groups succeeding preferentially at problem solving is it like um like you mentioned climate change so I would say like climate change is probably like more of like a conceptual issue and then once you once you've I- identified solutions then you can go and implement the solutions and then maybe when you're implementing a solution you would need like a chain of command or something like that just mm. to go and to get things on the ground. Yeah, yeah. But do you, do you mean in the sense that um uh let's go back to the climate change example. Um like we're kind of throwing our hands up like what do we do yeah. and versus all, all of us just sort of screaming at each other um taking the time to listen. Um which which so, so yeah. There's a chapter that also talks about leadership and you're right. Okay. Leadership is essential, I believe. Right, right, right. You know, right. but when we look to nature for example, you can see that leadership is very transitory and that seems to work very well. And also the role of a transformational leader, which has been again linked to group success. Mm. Transformational leaders generally see their role as being able to facilitate communication and extract information from the individual um, members of the team and then follow advice from the different members of the team that are offering their expertise. So when you look look at a group, basically the way that you can help maximize the success of a group is to ensure a that you're recruiting the right team so that you've got genetic and experienced diversity within the individual members of the team. B, you make sure that they've got um clearly delineated um areas of expertise. So they feel confident bringing forward their ideas and what they have to offer within their own area of expertise. Mm. You also make sure that they can communicate freely and they are confident at doing that, but they also um value listening and silence right, right, in right. some ways and periods for reflection. Um and transformational leaders can help with that process by ensuring that you can access all of the information that's available within those teams. Right, that, that, and then in order to make some of the difficult decisions on how you're going to proceed forward. That's that's very congruent with um with the thinking of I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Franz De Waal, he's a primatologist at Emory. Um anyways, he studies sort of hierarchies in chimpanzees and mm-hmm. he he's he makes your exact point where he says that the most uh efficacious leaders and the most long-lasting leaders are not the the tyrants that come and just bully everyone and like make everyone submit to them. It's effectively the people that can can create harmony among among the troop and exactly and yeah. sort of make sure everyone's opinion was was heard and they they felt seen and and this is this is in a, like a primate community yeah so if we bring that one level up to let's let's say humans and like human problems um i i can see how that makes a whole lot of sense yeah and he 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 ran a similar study to the one you're citing where he um he he was assessing surgery outcomes on surgical teams and surgery is a, a very male dominated uh, industry and he he came out with the same the same finding that 
the second you introduce females into the mix, the outcomes were better. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that's, that's very consistent with, um, with sort of some of the work that you're citing. Mm. Um, so I, 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 so if, if gender is the sort of the number one predictor of, of group success, you mentioned that um, you want to ensure that there's genetic diversity in mm-hmm. groups to make sure they succeed. So when you say genetic diversity, that, that can mean a lot of things. Yeah, um, so for example, we know that, we go back to, you know, conditions that were in some of the children in the psychiatric hospital where I worked 20 years ago. Um, autism, for example, um, ha, is thought to have a heritability, so a genetic predisposition, value of something in the region of 80 to 90%. So that's a high heritability. It's got a high genetic predisposition towards it. Um, and, you know, when we look at kind of big software companies like HP, they're really focusing on having a recruitment program um, specifically aimed at recruiting people that have a, um, autism diagnosis because they, you know that they've got strengths in their way of thinking. They're generally speaking very good at, you know, focusing in and concentrating with a high level of detail to a particular issue. That's and that can be a fantastic thing to have on your team. Absolutely. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then when you look at, and oh, there's some lovely studies from um, Gene Robinson. He's um, based in America and he's looking at... Um, uh, kind of beehives. Okay. So bees in a in a big beehive, right? If some calamity strikes the beehive, so for example, if the queen dies or if an intruder comes and starts um, invading the hive, then quite a lot of the bees will kind of get caught up in an emotional contagion and kind of like be wandering around, buzzing around frantically, not really knowing how to act. Whereas a subsection of the beehive, about 15, 20% of the bees, will just calmly get on pragmatically with the job in hand that they've been allocated to. So they won't get caught up in that emotional drama of what's happening there in that particular instance. And they'll just continue with the focus job that they have in hand. And those genes that are different for those particular subsection of um, bees that are behaving in that way are homologous to the genetic changes that we see in individuals with autism that again have a very um, focused attention to detail and can work in very concentrated way on particular tasks. So we see throughout evolution that, you know, there's different behaviours that confer different strengths that help the smooth running of a society or that help the smooth running of a hive or maybe help the smooth running of a business. And it, and it makes sense to try and tap into that difference, that diversity of thinking mm-hmm. to make the most of your hive being successful or your business being successful, which is what a lot of companies are doing now. And there's similar things. So for example, we know about ADHD um, that has a genetic predisposition again to it. It's it's a lower value than autism. Um, But again, it's linked to entrepreneurialism, lateral thinking, innovation. And again, it can be useful to have people that have ADHD within a team because of the strengths and thinking in the way that they think as well. Right. But you you mentioned um, some of these, what I think people would refer to like maladaptive um, sort of conditions. You mentioned um, autism and you mentioned ADHD and you think like evolutionarily, oh, how could that be valuable, right? Um, I think like th- there might be that stigma that that exists. Um, and it is, I, from from your last book, I sort of gathered that there's no, there's no true idea of like a biological normal. Um, the, uh, we, we exist sort of as a group and like we all have different things to offer. And so you, you, you mentioned, you, you mentioned autism and, and ADHD and Given the the right context, you can extract a lot a lot of value and um, from these modalities of thinking, if you will, um, mm-hmm. because they're sort of different than maybe um, the way that people perceptualize the world on average. Um, what about behaviors that um, are sort of it's it's less obvious to see the advantage of them? Um, let's say something like like schizophrenia. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so you know, um, it's thought that it's something in the region of, so schizophrenia is diagnosed in around 1% of the population. So mm-hmm. one in a hundred people have got schizophrenia and that's across the world and across many, many different decades as well. So historically, schizophrenia seems to have persisted across the human population. Um, now what people might not be aware of, and I was quite surprised when I found out, is that 17% of the population, the human population, admit to having experienced some kind of hallucination. So hearing or seeing things that aren't there. So that's a perceptual issue that's also seen in schizophrenia. 
Right. right. So it's actually very common. And that's without, you know, drugs or alcohol being involved. Mm -hmm. So that's just the general population experiencing these types of hallucinations that people with schizophrenia might also experience. Um, when we look at the genes involved, the genetic changes involved in schizophrenia, again, it's got high heritability of around, it's, you know, estimated to be around 80%, 90%. Slightly lower than 90%, so slightly less um, than autism. And it's, again, genes that are involved in laying down the wiring of the neural circuit of the baby in the womb and are also involved in how that neural circuit is going to function and operate throughout life. Um, when we also look at the genes that are involved, quite a lot of those genes have also been implicated in... Um, well, quite a lot of people with schizophrenia their relatives have a high creativity and a high innovation kind of um, behavioral characteristic. So there's some ideas that this condition, which is quite stable throughout our population and has a high heritability, the genetic changes that are associated with it confer an advantage up to a threshold, up to a point and that advantage is creativity and innovation. But once those genes converge, and it's thousand, like over 100 genes have been involved um, that we've identified so far, mm -hmm. but once those genes converge, it can reach a threshold, which can then, instead of conferring an advantage, actually confer a disadvantage to individuals. But possibly, as we find out more and more about schizophrenia, possibly in the future, we might start to see that there's like recruitment strategies uh, where we're actually tr actively trying to attract individuals that have a diagnosis because they think in a particular way as a result of the genes that they've been given. So the, there is there is an advantage um, to to that perceptual um, modality up up to a limit. That being creativity. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, with schizophrenia, it's slightly less clear. So like the data isn't completely there yet. So there's, yeah, so yes, Fair. there's no, there's no, so there's no general scientific consensus that says that people with schizophrenia in itself, people that have been diagnosed with schizophrenia are more creative and innovative, mm -hmm. but you can see consistently that relatives are. So there seems to be some kind of genetic uh, reason behind it that's conferring some advantage, but it reaches a threshold. But perhaps there are some advantages to schizophrenia as well that we, you know, the, the, the data isn't there yet. But per right. perhaps in the future, we might similarly view these very complex conditions in the similar way to how we now currently view autism or ADHD. So you, you um, use the example of the workplace to sort of highlight the advantages of multiple modalities of thinking and different genetic predispositions. Are there other contexts that we should, as like a collective, um, sort of consider this genetic diversity that we should try and invoke people from different areas to sort of enhance and make better? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I also look at, um, so friendship groups that we were talking about right. earlier a little bit. Um, but also I talk about the family being the cradle for intelligence and how collective intelligence actually emerges from the family unit. Um, and, you know, it's useful to have multi-generational family members kind of at working as a group. Because when you look at the neurobiology of what happens within the brain during the typical lifespan, you can see that different ages are associated with different brain strengths and different ways of operating. Mm. So for example, the younger people are, generally speaking, the more innovative and better they are at um, lateral problem solving skills. As we get older, we experience more and we accrue more wisdom from the world generally speaking hopefully we do um, but we also start to filter out information from the outside world and instead rely more on our stored information so our prior assumptions about the world which is why sometimes you know much older people can come across as being quite rigid in their thinking stubborn maybe Fair. it's because their brain is literally weighing information in a very different way to younger brains so there's different ways of seeing the world and there's different ways of um, having brain strengths. And when you bring a family together, actually you can see that those brain strengths that are on offer across different generations can come together to create a really successful group sometimes. Or sometimes there's lots of arguments. <laughs> I think that's interesting because I, um, as you're suggesting, sort of the, the nature of the brain and the way we process information changes over the lifespan. So... Mm -hmm. Is it such that um, 
as a young child, it would be good to be around someone with more crystallized intelligence because they sort of make up for what you're lacking. Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's some lovely studies that have shown, for example, when a grandmother sees her grandchild, um, her brain region will light up with joy and empathy much more than if she saw her, her own child. So it gives a generation that so she's got this reward that's intrinsic within her to spend time with her grandchild. Um, and the grandchild benefits from the crystallized knowledge and the wisdom that the grandparent can offer. Now, that particular study was just looking at grandmothers, but there's been a recent study looking at the grandfather's involvement. So there's a culture within China where grandfathers actually play a much more active role. And when they do play a much more active role in their grandchild's life, then actually the um the the um success of that grandchild increases remarkably oh so so what is the grandparent um so the grandfather in that case offering to the child that they they wouldn't get elsewhere companionship wisdom knowledge ah i see yeah and that, that that relationship across the generations that care and that support and that wisdom that the grandparent is offering can actually benefit the younger brain through the wisdom and the support that it's it's providing but also primed into that grandparents uh, brain through this when we have a look at how the bright brain lights up with empathy and emotional understanding is this requirement this kind of need um to kind of link with the younger generation and then when we look at the grandparents actually the more actively they seem to be involved in their grandchildren's life um that there's increases in their well-being and their health wow so the, the, there's preferential outcomes for those children who have that exposure. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. And and it seems that the grandparents that are getting involved also do better. Well, it might be, there is a caveat to this. It okay. might be that those grandparents that are too ill to actually actively contribute to their grandchildren's lives, obviously there's an underlying health issue. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. So there might be some, so there's some confounding factors there, but. I, I can see that making a lot of sense. You know, we've evolved living sort of um, in multi-generational sort of environments. I think the, the, the family unit as it's it's um described in like the modern times where it's just like your nuclear family is like a, rather a new idea we used to live sort of like with grandparents and, yeah. and cousins and in like large tribes and stuff so that, yeah. that makes sense to me um and, you're, you're, and it doesn't have to be though just your you know families come in all different sizes and shapes nowadays don't they and it doesn't have to be just your genetic relations sure. you know there's there's other people within your community that can take on those roles you know and that can be very beneficial when you have those relationships across generations um so we're getting ready to wrap up i want yeah. i want to to ask you about friendship so you mentioned within the family um <gasps> can i close on so actually i'm so sorry can i just really interrupt so so, so also in joined up thinking i look at how we can start to harness the collective intelligence that's on offer within a group more effectively in a without conflict um, <laughs> and doing it so that everybody benefits and, and, and is happy doing so. So there's some lovely studies looking at brain synchronicity, for example. So mm. our brains fire with electrical oscillations moving. So electrical signals zip across that neural circuit that's laid down in our brain. Um, baby's brain and the electrical um, kind of signals zip along at speeds of around 120 miles an hour, you know, minimum. But we can actually measure those electrical signals across the brain using EEG. And what people have found is that when groups of people are working together and effectively problem solving and learning together and building consensus, then actually you get more brain synchronicity. So those electrical signals start to become in step with each other. They become in time and synchronized with each other, right? The better the group's working, the more it's learning, the more synchronicity there is between the individual members. So is there anything that we can do to try and help boost brain synchronicity so that we can help groups of people, whether it's a family, whether it's a team at work, whether it's a friendship group, whether it's wider society at large, is there anything that we can do to help boost that brain synchronicity within the group? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. So, okay. yeah, so that's handy. So direct eye to eye uh, gaze contact. So looking people in the eye when you're communicating with them, that helps. Um, but also things like um, synchronized activity. So it's thought that singing together helps oh. boost brain synchronicity, but also exercising together in a synchronized way. So exercise is linked as well to this ability to form brain synchronicity throughout our life. So that seems to be linked. So if you want to create a nice harmonious team, then try listening to each other, gazing each other in the eye, 
not in a weird way. (laughs) (laughs) And and doing activities like singing or, you know, doing some exercise together. I think that's fantastic. So there's, there is a lot of merit to, you know, like office culture, like on Fridays, you know, like dressed out Fridays and then they have like activities and we do things outside of work. There's a lot of merit to those things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It helps. It literally helps bring people together that might have had very different backgrounds, very different experiences, very different areas of expertise. It helps bring those people together so that you can start thinking in tune with each other and understanding each other a little bit more and then more innovatively problem solving. And when you say brain synchronicity, these are like more than just like nice feelings towards each other. We're literally sort of, we, we're thinking in the same way, if the, you will. The electrical oscillations across the brain become in step. Ah. Pretty cool, hey? Yeah, very cool, very cool. Yeah. Um, but we also see that, um, like, you know, our physiology becomes can become in step with each other as well. So heartbeats, for example, can mm-hmm. become in step with each other. If I was frightened, I'd be giving off a signal through my sweat, which you probably wouldn't be aware of, which you'd process the smell of, which would l- tell you that I'm frightened. And so it would probably increase your heart rate so that you could get ready to physiologically for any threat that might be affecting you. So there's all of these mechanisms that are in play to help us work together as a unified group so that we can start to protect ourselves as individuals, but also help help to protect the group and there's emotions for example if your neighbor is happy then it increases the chance that you're happy by something in the region of 26 percent wow we're really influenced by each other yeah very evidently very much so there is a science of fate right there is a biological predisposition but there is also the effect of people around us and the whole reason for this as i argue in the books is that it's so that When we come together as a group, we can share information and we can work together and get our way out of any challenges, any problems that arise from the environment. That's fantastic. Um, So with that larger message that you're describing, Mm -hmm. um, what is your hope for your readers and where can they find you? Oh, okay. Um, So yeah, you can get the books on independent bookstores and Amazon, for example. Um, And... Um, TED Talks, TEDx Talk is being released hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Oh, lovely. Yes, uh, on Joined Up Thinking. Um, and I'm giving a talk in Cambridge in a couple of weeks as well at the Jesus College Intellectual Forum and also for the undergraduates here. Um, what else am I doing? Last week I was in Westminster talking to some of the civil servants there. Um, yeah, so <laughs> bits and bobs, bits and bobs, yeah. Very yeah, cool, good. very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Critchlow. Oh, thank it's you a, for the interesting discussion. It's been a pleasure. It was really thank good you. talking to you. Thank you. Cheers.